Beckwith Wiedemann syndrome is something that you may have come across on your neonatal rotations, and if you cast your minds back, you may also remember it from some of your basic science teaching at medical school. It's an example of genomic imprinting. If you think back to your normal inheritance patterns, both the father and the mother will contribute genes. In Beckwith Wiedemann and other examples of genomic imprinting, the number of total chromosomes remains intact. In normal inheritance, you have the number of total chromosomes remains the same, and both sets of chromosomes are functionally active. In genomic imprinting, on the other hand, although the number of chromosomes remains the same, only one set is functionally active. So you can see here that although you have both the male and the female contributing, only one of these remains active. And this can be either along the whole chromosome or along specific areas. The area that's effective in beckwith Beedman syndrome is along this part, 11p15. This is an interesting area because it's responsible for areas such as insulin, but also for insulin-like growth factor, and for some oncogenes and some tumour suppressor genes. The exact pattern of inheritance in beckwith Beedman syndrome varies greatly, and thus the clinical pattern that you see may also vary. One of the key characteristic features of beckwith Beedman is growth, probably related to the IGF-2. So there tends to be overgrowth, and this can occur antenatally, so that babies are born very large for dates, or postnatally, or both. This may explain why beckwith Wiedemann is also associated with an increased risk of prematurity. So up to a third of babies are born below 35 weeks. The growth can affect all areas, and leads to some complications. For example, there can be organomegaly. Macroglossia is a characteristic feature, and this can lead to feeding difficulties. The overgrowth can also disrupt the pattern of growth that is seen. This can lead to cardiac complications because there are congenital cardiac defects, but also leads to abdominal wall defects, such as oxomphalus. The ears may also be affected. Another key feature of beckwith Wiedemann is hypoglycemia. This occurs in around half of all newborns with the syndrome and is usually mild and transient. However, some babies may need ongoing treatment for several months and it's something to consider in a child who has ongoing hypoglycemia that is otherwise unexplained. There is also an association with neoplasms, most commonly Wilms tumours, and this is probably related to that area which is responsible for tumour suppressor genes and oncogenes being affected. Although there are clear genetic patterns in beckwith Friedman, the inheritance is, as we said, very complex and can differ between different families and inheritance groups. Because of this, the diagnostic criteria for beckwith Wiedemann remained clinical, so it can be diagnosed in the presence of all three major symptoms, and that is either the presence of overgrowth and macroglossia and an abdominal wall defect. In the absence of one of these, so if you only have two major features, you could also diagnose it with two major and three of the following minor features. So the minor features are ear signs, such as alteration in earlobe creases or the presence of helical pits, a facial nevus, hypoglycemia, organomegaly and hemihypertrophy. This occurs in around 25% of children with beckwith Wiedemann, and is certainly something that I've seen come up in clinical exams in the past.